Good morning and welcome to our Live Talk program. This is Loigo here, your host on Revive Reform Radio, doing our Live Talk program covering uh, current events on your Thursday morning rise and shine. Current events we're looking at this morning here, and we're looking at this topic, automation, um, creating a financial shift. And so I'm looking at automation and um, the policies that are around the modern world and how they are creating a, a financial shift. And I think we're witnessing that. And so I'm going to talk about that this morning here as I talk about what's going on in the world on a financial basis. So welcome again to our live talk program. Hopefully you had a blessed night rest and you're ready to take on today. God bless you. Let's pray. Our Father, Lord in heaven, we thank thee again, dear Lord, for your love. We thank you for your wisdom and we thank you for the insights that you give us within your Bible, within the word that we might know what's coming and how to live. May you bless us, dear Lord, as I read these articles and share these things with those who are here this morning. For Christ's sake, amen. So we're looking here at um, this um, topic here. I have two articles I want to share with you, and then I have some thoughts that I want to share with you because we're, we're familiar with um, some of what the Bible says um, about what will be happening in the end of time. So what will be going on in the end of time? And over the years, for me, I've noticed that there's a uh, continued um, push by many about how things are going to shape up. And often I realize when I read the Bible and I read what the Word says about how things are going to be in the end time, I realize that uh, part of the problem is probably the sin of imagination, is um, or the, the, the failure, I should say, is the imagination, the uh, why we sometimes miss the mark in Bible prophecy is that we can't imagine how things could shape up to go a certain direction. And what I believe we're witnessing with what we call um, automation or AI, you know, artificial intelligence and other such means is that what it's going to create is going to be a shift in how um, the poor um, earn a living and how disposable the poor more and more. It's going to become and it will end up fulfilling certain things so before i read these two articles i'm going to share with you two texts and i'm going to explain to you what i mean when i say the failure of imagination that sometimes the, we read the bible the bible says such and such is going to happen in the end of time and we say well it's happening now and we might be right but to a degree to the lesser degree and i believe that things are going to get worse so Two passage, and I'm going to go to two articles. I'm going to come back to some more passage and talk to you about and kind of pull it all together. What am I witnessing, and what you're witnessing, and what shift is going on? <clears throat> because as you go around, you see there is this constant closing of brick and mortar stores. So you know, Sears went down, um, Toys R Us went down, all these various different um, mom and pop shop going down, and all these shops would normally hire lower end workers and um, some higher end workers you know the managers and supervisors but the majority of the staff are people that are lower end there's an owner to a mom and pop sh shop and he owns it an example of what I'm seeing here if you have time you go online and you put in um, what's happening with I think it's called Dollar General and uh, you see that Dollar General is opening up hundreds of stores every year and what they're doing, they're knocking out the mom and pop stores. But as they knock the mom and pop stores out, what end up happening is that the mom and pop stores, I think they say on the average probably hire 18 workers. You know, most of those workers are, and this is an example, but you go and watch it, you get a proper number. Most of those workers are what you will call lower end paying workers. They work in minimum wage or slightly above. Um, Don General probably can, they say, could operate of five or six workers because they don't do a lot of things like produce and stuff like that. So everything is kind of prepackaged already. So you don't need a lot of staff to handle the merchandise, so to speak. Merchandise is the word I'm talking about, so to speak. So when you have that type of situation running, what you have now is like more lower end workers job cutting and it's going to what I call AI automation. And um, and that's what's happening. So you think about Sears, you think about all of that. The people who used to work in those stores, they all got their job cut. But those are low-end workers. So the more, more lower-end workers, and when I say lower and lower-paying jobs that you have available, those who still, the people are going to have to, I guess, fight for a lower-end job, they could become more desperate. 
So what they'll do and the type of abuses they'll suffer is going to be more than a person who um, has options because they have not much option at the end of the list when it comes on to job options and availability. And a good example of that, again, is with Sears. You look at what's going on with Sears, but again, you have less workers because you could have something like an Amazon.com. You could have, they are selling so many more products, but yet they're moving all this product, but yet they could have less staff because a lot of the work is done by artificial intelligence and automation. And so the physical and the computer programming can run most of the jobs. So who again get cut out of the workforce? The lower end worker. So that to me is creating an environment where the more of that you have is the lower uh, the, 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 the demand and the more desperate the lower end worker get. And hopefully I'm saying it right because just bear with me here if I'm not using the most beautiful description low end worker lower edge age, lower wages worker what whatever you call it no what's the proper way to describe that so now you have like i'll give one example before i read these two texts so you have another situation just to kind of build this up here this morning you have another situation like i remember i was talking to somebody i uh, was on vacation one time and i was talking to a tailor um in jamaica and he was saying to me you know um now they have the machines that can basically you put the pattern in the machine and you basically can basically cut sew and you can do this with as minimal input from a worker so the more that type of technology becomes um um powerful and we're there we're right there where it's either been brought online or it's been worked on is the more that lower end worker will be working there working for say ten dollars a day or eight dollars a day in Malaysia, Vietnam, wherever, is the more you can cut that their work out. And if they're already desperate working for such low wages, imagine what will happen when you can cut them even more, how desperate they're gonna become. And how much now what's gonna end up happening now are they I end of the workforce, the CEO, the owners, they'll end up be able to amass more what they're able to end up to sorry for that, they're able to end up amassing more wealth. And this is gonna create now the type of scenario that we saw coming because the Bible says it, but we just didn't see it at the level because our often our imagination couldn't run hard enough and so that's why over the years i hear people preach prophecy and i always thought i don't think it's their interpretation is the only problem i think is they cannot imagine what's coming even though they were told that and we were often told that our imagination can't even run how things are going to shape up because we just can't see it that way because we're kind of blinded so i believe now ai which is artificial intelligence and automation it's going to change the game just like it changed it back in the mid 1800s because you didn't need the slaves anymore and just like it changed it again in jim crow times and it changed it in the civil rights times um and it's going to change it again i think we're in the shift you know when they talk about uh, there's a shift in the matrix quote unquote um we're gonna we're i think we're witnessing it we're living in it and i think most people not thinking what is going to happen? And I think what's happening is the two texts. So real quickly, I'll read um, James chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. It says, Go to now, James chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. It says, Go to now, ye rich men, and weep and howl, for your misery shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were a fire ye have heap treasures together for the last days we'll pause here real quick so if you notice there they have heap treasures and the treasure they heap is just sitting you know prophetically or metaphorically sitting and rusting in and gathering dust in doing nothing so it's not that there's not resources is the resources are being stored so people are doing without while the resources are being stored now somebody said well yeah i'm familiar with this passage 
I can see that this is what happening now. What I'm saying to you is I believe that it gets worse. The riches become even more stored than what we can now imagine. Notice here, behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your field, which is kept back by fraud, cried, and the cry of them which have reaped have en are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth, and have been wanton, and ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. That means they have set themselves up to be killed, like in the French Revolution. So, if you take that into consideration, you'll see real quickly there that there's an issue here in the last days about heaping treasures. But what we have seen over the last, say, 20 years with AI and automation is that the phenomenal ability for people to use technology and automation to be able to heap treasures because more automation, less workers. But the workers that are being cut out are the workers that are more on the low end spectrum. Notice here the Bible talk about somebody that has reaped the field because, again, those are the real low end workers. The people that are really doing the grunt work, the hard work, they now are not just, it doesn't say that they don't get pay. If they've kept back their wages by fraud, so you're defrauding them. Fraud is normally, um, I you know, the product costs a hundred dollars, and I pay you fifty, and I figured out to fraud defraud you. Um, it's it's I'm figuring out a way to defraud you, and that's part of the problem because again, if you're doing work and a person know that you're desperate, and that work is becoming limited, they can defraud you because what are you gonna do about it? Especially if, as you see what's happening more and more across the world, the person who is paying you, no, I can do certain things because I have the government in my pocket. Uh, the next important text to note there, and as I say, the text states something. And for me, I just see it as it depends how you view what's happening and what's coming. Because if I read this text back in the mid-1800s, the middle of the 1800s, um, somebody could say, wow, but, I, you know, I could see how you could concentrate more money. If I, if I read the same text in the middle of the 1900s, you could say, wow, I could see how you could concentrate more money because the equipment and technology is becoming more ubiquitous. It's becoming more prevalent. But now we're seeing that when you look at almost all the richest people in the world, uh, one thing you see they have in common is that it is tied to something technology-based. Is if it's a retailer, he has a massive investment in technology, both in computer technology and in automation, me mechanical technology. And if you look at that, you notice there's like this narrative that's being built. But if that narrative continue, which it is, because all the inventions and the experimentations are running now what you'll find is more workers are going to get cut out. Uh, and the not next quick text to read is in R Revelation 18. Now, Revelation 18 is looked upon as what we call the loud cry. It's the final cry of God's mer message of mercy. But if you read the whole of Revelation 18, you'll quick quickly notice that it starts out with the first four verses and there's an emphasis on religion and that something has gone wrong in religion because it talks about you know, worship and Bible and all that. But the rest of Revelation 18, you'll quickly note that this has to do with commerce. Nowhere you find this type of emphasis, um, probably except probably in the Old Testament, of commerce, that something is wrong with commerce in the last days. And that's the main focus. It starts off with, you know, spiritualism, false doctrine, and then it goes straight into commerce that the men of the earth have become maddened by commerce and they're not doing right and God sees it as evil. So you can pick that idea up um, in um, in verse, uh, we take it verse 5 and then I'm going to my articles. It says, um, for her sins have reached unto heaven and God will remember her iniquities. Reward her even as she, as she, as she rewarded you and double unto her according to the works. Um, her works in the cup which she had filled fill to her double how much she had glorified herself and lived deliciously so much torment and sorrow give her for she said in her heart I am I sit a queen 
and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plague come in one day, death, mourning, famine, and she shall be utterly burnt with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And notice here now it says in verse 9, And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Then standing afar off for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for no one, uh, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. And then it lists their merchandise of gold, silver, and you can read the rest of it. And it just goes into this talk about merchandise, merchandise, all the way down until you come to really the end of it, where it talks about even they invest in, you know, sorcery and all that type of stuff, and people are deceived by it. So keep those two texts in mind, and when you look at that, you have to look at it in your own thinking and think, okay, how bad does it get? How much control does the merchant, the shipmasters, the, the people who transport good, how much riches do they amass in the last days? How much do they work with the, you know, the, the prosper, the gospel preachers to corrupt the earth, and the kings of the earth to corrupt the earth? How much? How bad does it get? Because if you look at Revelation 14, Revelation 14 does not end and talk about kings. It seemed to be at that time, in the 1800s, there was this, this problem was there, but it was not the main focus of the Bible. But we come to Revelation 18, it seemed to be the, 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 the pinpoint focus that the false churches are in bed with the, what you call the, the guys that are in charge of the money. The money and the church have come together and it's become the main sin of the last day so keep that in mind and what i'm going to do now is share with you two articles here that talks about some of the stuff that are happening um in the world and then i'm going to come back after those and i'm going to talk well i'm going to intersperse them with the comments and i'm going to talk about now this idea of how i see how the ai and the automation is changing the face of how business is done and is creating the problem that we read in Revelation is making it larger than even how I saw it many years ago when I was looking at those texts. Uh, because the more I see this, the more I said, this is fascinating what they can do now. So here is two articles. The first, both of them are from The Guardian and they are opinion pieces. So they're just, I'm just sharing opinion pieces because I'm showing you that other people are looking into this problem and they're seeing trouble coming. So this first one is written by two People um, call themselves reverends, and um, it's entitled "American Once Fought a War Against Poverty, Now It Wages a War on the Poor," and this is from the Guardian. dot com. It says after the 1968 Poor People's Campaign declared silence, um, campaign declared silence was um, betrayal. We are coming together um, to stand up um, to the public policy violence that is ravaging our society. In 2013, um, Kaylee Greer, daughter Venus, died in her arms after a battle with breast cancer. If caught early, the five-year survival rate of women diagnosed with breast cancer is close to 100%. But Venus' cancer went undiagnosed for months because she couldn't afford health in insurance. She lives in Alabama, a state that refuses to expand Medicare, Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. Venus' debt is not an isolation, isolated incident. More than 250,000 people like her die in the United States from poverty and related issues every year. Access to health care is just one of the issues facing the 140 million people who live in poverty in the U.S. today. Over the past two years, the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, has carried out a listening tour in dozens of states across the nation. this nation. We have met with tons of, tens of thousands of um, people from El Paso, Texas to South, South Charleston, 
West Virginia to Selma, Alabama, where we met Callie, gathering testimony from poor people and listening to their demands for a better society. On Tuesday, we announced a poor people's campaign, a Moral Agenda, a set of demands that is drawn from this listening tour, as well as an audit of American America who conduct with allies, ally well, um, allied organization, including the Institute for Policy Studies and the Urban Institute 50 years after the original Poor People's Campaign. As, as grim as the situation was in 1968, the appalling truth is deep inequalities still exist and in some ways we are worse off. While our nations once fought a war against poverty, now we wage a war on the poor. The richest 1% in our country owns more wealth than the bottom 90%. Tightening this grip on political power to shape labor, tax, health, and campaign finance policies that benefit the few at the expense of the many. A full 60% more Americans now live below the, po the official poverty line than in 1968, and 40 3% of all American children's, uh, children live below the minimum income level considered necessary to meet basic family need. Right, so I'll pause there again. So that's important. That, quest, that, that section there is important because I've been looking at this and I've been planning to do some programs in the future, which I will, on some of these numbers because the numbers that many people are looking at is the numbers from the time of the civil rights movement and the, um, the campaign against poverty that was done by one of the Kennedy brothers, if I remember right. And so what has happened since the 1960s until now is many people are looking at that. The people that were the primary target of these programs, would it be the war, war and campaign on, on, for poor people? or would it be the civil rights, they're fearing worse off than then as a percentage. Uh, so what has really happened? So as this two individual here are pointing out in this opinion piece, they're saying something has gone wrong. And so this morning here, this is what I want to talk about. Not so much what they're talking about per se, but what I'm looking at is that the situation is going to get worse uh, because if you look at the numbers, the numbers are bearing up that things have gotten worse, that the poor and the percentage of what they own, you know, from in the 1960s is less. They've owned less. They have less resources as a percentage of what the people in the 1% have. So things have not gotten better. There's more concentration of wealth. And it's important to note that what they say is that the 1% rich in our country have done more to affect the whole system through what we call lo lobbies, where they'll, they've put their power and their money to lobby Congress to basically um, shape labor laws, tax laws. I always also say pay rate, but labor laws, tax laws, health care, and even campaign finance so they can continue putting big money into campaign. Uh, it's not the poor people that are voting has anything to do with this. This is all controlled by those at the top. Uh, poor people don't do what you call it, um, the super funds. Uh, I think that's what they call it, or the super, whatever, you know, the, the super thing that they, the super PACs. Poor people don't do that. They're, where you should some poor people starting a super PAC? You can see one billionaire startup super PAC. You're like, wow. And you can pay for unlimited advertisement. But who is he advertising to? He's not advertising to his local billionaire. He's advertising to poor people to vote against their self and vote against their best interests. And this is what's happening. So when you look at this, you see how as long as you can keep a certain narrative going that is against people who are suffering, you're good. So keep going here. Just want to think about that. Now, 
continue the article because let's say this article is written by two people who are advocates for the poor and so forth. Not necessarily that I'm with all what I'm saying, but I just want to show you that there's others who are concerned with what's going on, even if their opinions might be slightly different from yourself or myself. The, the idea is that there's a there's a major problem, and we're gonna talk more. It says in the, back to the article here. It says in the last eight years alone, twenty three states have passed voter suppression laws, gotten the voting act rights, um, act civil rights leaders helped secured more than half a century ago. This is true. This is the true hacking of our democracy, allowing people to win office who deny health care, living wage, cut necessary social program, and push policies that promote mass incarceration, hurt immigration, immigrants, and devastate our environment. Um, uh, and so it it continue i'll keep reading i'll just read it as the article goes i won't i was going to think to cut this part here so these racist laws hurt not just people of color but poor whites who live um lives our lives are appended by the politicians put in office um by the violent extremism that is voter suppression so this person is big on voter rights and all that so notice what he's saying here she both here she's saying because a male and female i wrote this that what you have going on uh huh what you have going on let me see if i can just crank this up a little thanks for that heads up about my volume all right so hopefully that works a little bit so what you have going on here is notice that they say here, um, so I guess my volume was a little bit loud. Thanks for kind of guiding me. It's hard for me to know how loud my volume is. You, so it's important if somebody give me a feedback because I, I'm, I'm hearing myself by my earphone. I can't, so I don't know what you're hearing. So um, it's, it's, if you notice there that he's saying here, this is what we saw, especially in the last election, that the people who voted for Donald Trump, which is a billionaire. I'm not talking about Donald Trump per se, but I'm talking about a system. He is replaceable. You can put anybody in that position, um, anybody like that in that um, place, and they'll get the same result. Uh, what I'm talking about here is, so uh, a person that's very rich that never took care of the poor or was ever concerned about what's going on for the poor. This was like, there was no track record. So you have a person that never had a track record and he comes along and he said, look, I've been suing poor workers and poor contractors all these years to make sure they do free labor for me and cheap labor. Now I'm going to come, I'm going to run, I'm going to take care of you guys, poor guys. So who voted? The people, oh, it's better, great. So the people who were poorer voted, but they're voting for things to cut their benefits and their anything to take care of them. And why this is so important for me? Because I remember thinking about it, that there was a lot of poor areas that had lost the coal mining jobs, right? So when you think about that, they had lost coal mining jobs and they were told that the coal mine jobs are going to come back, all right? And then Hillary had said, they're not coming back. And I remember they would play clips with her saying, they're not going to come back. And in my mind, I know that unless you, you've been snoozing or you just, you just lost your mind, those jobs are not coming back because um, if you go online when you have time, go on the YouTube and type in automated um, mine equipment, uh, uh, no, remote control or fully odd AI mine equipment. So the same type of thing where they have self-driving cars, now they have automated or self-driving mining equipment where, you know, you know, these trucks that are like five, six, whatever stories high. And they're using mines. You can see beautifully. I mean, it just looks crazy. Like these trucks are so huge, and you can see them driving in a mine pit, going getting the the, the 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 ore or the natural resource and bringing it back back and forth. And nobody's inside of it. It's just all totally being driven by, as I say, wire or driven by, you know, not remote control because nobody's controlling it. It's just driving by itself, and it goes to the site get what it needs to get and bring it back and go back and forth waiting to happen and this is these are newer technology that is being rolled out literally in the last few years what are you going to happen to those mining jobs you don't need a person 
you send a equipment, a robot into the mine shaft, or if it's strip mine, strip mining, where you mine on the surface, you just send a, a robot in. It does the digging and drilling, and then you take another robot and you pack those trucks, and the truck bring it to where it needs to bring it, and send it on the conveyor belt. What you just did, you just eliminated people's job, low people, low end jobs. That's what's coming, and to you, to you can imagine, you could tell people vote to make sure that we don't change any of the laws now to match what's happening in the technology world and in the automation world because these things are coming but you're telling them oh no 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 don't vote for don't listen to that guy that guy is of the devil vote for the guy who is going to tell you keep the laws the same as a matter of fact give more to the rich because they'll give you back some crumbs off the table this is voting against your own best interests and the safety of the society. Because to me, by the time the people realize what's happening, it's going to be too late. And that's, what, that's what to me what the Bible is tell, telling us. That it's, it's, that's why the rich are amassing all this money for their own slaughter. Because it's, it's, I think the people are going to wake up to this reality and realize, wow, what we just did, we just voted and we never changed the laws. It's like we're operating in the 60s. But technology and the reality of how the rich get a mass wealth are have moved on 50, 60, 70 years. And we never changed the laws. And this is to me what I see coming. So any of notice here, the article says, the rules might seem to be hitting the poor baby mama or welfare queen because that's how it's sold by people in the news media and people in the, you know, in the, in the, in the radio world. But really those rules are going to hit, is hitting everybody because across the nation, poor whites are losing their jobs at the same alarming rate. And this is what they're not picking up on because they're, they're sold it and say, oh, I'm just doing it against the poor black welfare queen who like free stuff. And that's what they sold all the years. And then we're doing, we're voting against the illegal immigrants that we basically don't change the immigration law so they come here and work for cheap and we can pay them even less than we can pay and the rich people get get it because remember somebody's employing these immigrant immigrants that are here illegally who is it if you you're poor white you you don't have you know five dollars to, to rub together who is employing those people you're not so it's the same rich person who said if they're, they're faithful to america but they're the one that's stabbing everybody in the back because they want those poor workers to hear. A uh, few more points of this one, all right? And then we move on. Well, when you think about some of what's going on, and it's a lot here, I'm showing out here, but Carita Scott King <clears throat> would call all this violence. She says that violence isn't just killing people with guns, but denying them living wages, allowing them to live in ghetto housing. We rightfully get in the streets and protest when the police shoot and arm black men, but we must also stand up in the public, stand up to the public policy violence that is ravaging our society. We must no longer allow inattention to violence to keep the poor, people of color, and other disenfranchised people down. People are poor not because they are lazy, not because they are unwilling to work hard but because politicians have blocked living wages and health care and undermined union rights and wage increases. Our nation moral narrative is shaped by Christian nationalists whose claim run contrary to the call to cause in the scripture, which is very clear that we need to care for the poor immigrants and least amongst us. So before I finish out this, so notice here, just just want to sum up some, some of these things because I'm going to go to the next article shortly. Notice he says that Kurdic Scott King said violence is just not killing people with guns. Uh, because no, think about it, most wars come after things have gotten out of control. You see, you, you normally see a war, and if you're not understanding of how wars come about, you you know I don't know that it's almost always linked to oppression you will never understand why there's war and that the violence that you see as a uh, end result of war is just simple violence that is because policies were put in place that basically hurt those who are poor 
And the moment you get that, then you kind of see why guerrilla warfare, terrorism, all these crazy things that people look at and say, oh, why the, why the poor people are rising up and fighting? Because <laughs> they're poor. You know, they have nothing to live for often. And they have nothing to lose, so to speak, because the system have robbed them. And because often they're not thinking. You see, a poor me having this conversation with you, think about it. A poor person doesn't, for the most part, have this conversation. They just worried about stuff that poor people worry about. They're not thinking about that stuff. So they're getting caught and getting hit over the head. And they don't even know what hit them because they're not thinking like that. But a rich person, he goes to, say, Harvard Business School and he's going there and they're teaching him how to conquer empires and overthrow empires and all that he has a total different mindset <laughs> he's just thinking in ways and she's just thinking in ways just to conquer and rip and rob and you know so it's just it's a different mindset and the other person there they don't know they're just trying to live life and get some food so notice he says the poor are not lazy the reality is the poor are not lazy but some poor people are lazy and so you know that but i agree that there are many people who are poor but they work very hard they work harder than any ceo but the CEO would say, well, I'm deserving of my money because I work so hard. And then they said, well, how about this guy over here? He's working seven days a week, 10 hours a day. You're, you're outworking him? Um, so there is some truth there in a big way that not all poor people are lazy. Um, and also that politicians are block living wages, health care, and undermine union rights and wage increase. So you know depends on where you fall in the spectrum but the big thing i see here is this thing i'm gonna read it to you again our nation's moral narrative is shaped by christian nationalists have you noticed that because i've been noticing that that the people really who shape in like a lot of the rules and laws are christian nationalists they're nationalists that they flag waving nationalists and they're also christians but they ignore she, she and he says here um, what the scripture calls for, the scripture calls for that you're going to need to take care of the poor and the immigrant, those who are strangers and the least amongst us, whether it be the fatherless, the disabled, the sick. But you go to a Christian nationalist and you think, man, this person is a Christian. And when you start hearing them open their mouth, you're like, man, they seem to hate anybody that is not rich. And that's what coming out of the churches. This is why when the Bible in the last days said the church is babbling and it's wicked and it's going to be destroyed by God. You can see why these Christian people are just lost their minds. And they're shaping the policy of the United States. Now notice there it says, if you claim to be evangelical or Christians and have nothing to say about poverty and racism, then you claim is terribly suspect. There needs to be a new moral discourse in this nation. And one that say being poor is not a sin, but systematic poverty is. When you have a system to keep people poor, that's a sin. This is why slavery was a sin. This is why Jim Crow law was a sin. Because Jim Crow law and slavery was, you have a system put in place to keep people poor. This is why segregation and redlining and all these things was a sin. Because it's not like the person, if I'm working hard and you have a system in place that no matter how hard I work, you're going to keep me poor. Then that's a sin. because And especially if I'm ignorant of what you're doing. And I don't understand your system. Then that's the sin. Because the sin is, you're telling me, oh, work hard, work hard. And I'm like, okay, 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 I'll work hard. And then at the end of the year, I'm like, man, I'm still poor. Then 10 years later, I'm like, man, I'm still poor. And I'm foolish to don't know that you systematically set the system that I always be poor. That's a sin. And that's the sin. And here, they're so right. If, because somebody say, well, oh, no, they're poor because they're black. It's because they color of their skin. No, that's a sin. Because if I outwork you and try to outmaneuver you, and no matter what you do, you seek certain laws and say after I figure out your laws and I figure out how to beat you at your game, then you go and say, hey, look, IRS, go raid that guy and steal all his property and claim you know, that he didn't pay his tax. Then that's a sin. That's systematic. Now, that's a system that you set up to... Make sure that person keep poor. So this is right. So, But often this is done through policy. And it, the policy now more and more is, I would think a lot of time, is even less racism and more so the policy set to take care of the rich.
So the moral agenda was announced on Tuesday, demanding a massive overall of the nation voting rights, new programs to lift up the 140 million American living in poverty, immediate attention to ecologic devastation and measures to curb militarism and war and the war economy. We call for a major change to address systematic racism, poverty, ecologic devastation, the economy, economy and our distorted moral narrative, including restoration and expansion of the 1965 Voters' Rights Act, repeal of the 2017 federal um, tax law, implementing implementation of the federal and state living wage and universal single-payer health system, clean water for all. Um, to make sure these demands are heard, poor and disenfranchised people from coast to coast are preparing for 40 days of action um, centered around state houses and U.S. Capitol over six weeks this spring. People of all race, color, creed are joining together to engage in nonviolent uh, moral fusion, direct action, massive voter mobilization and building. Um, power building from the bottom to prepare for the 40 days poor disenfranchised people clergy advocates will participate in nonviolent direct action training across the country on saturday they're claiming and now 50 years after the leaders of the 1968 poor people's campaign declared silent silence was betrayal we are coming together to break the silence and tell the truth about the interlocking evil of sy systemic racism poverty ecological devastation, the war economy, and distorted moral narrative. All over the country, poor people like Charlie or uh, Kaylee, sorry, are joining together. We support with support from clergy advocates. As she said on Tuesday, unveiling um, our demand, we are going to, we are not going to keep um, crying. We are going to march. We are going to protest. We are going to vote. And this is written by Reverend Dr. Um, William Bar uh, Barber and Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris are co-chairs of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call to moral revival. So just for your clarity, I'm uh, not planning to join them per se, um, I'm, but at least I'm, I read it here. So that's my support for whatever they're doing. Some of what they're doing, I'm not per se um, for it, but most of what they're doing, um, I believe this is there's need to be a moral clarity in the country. The prosperity gospel and the mainline churches have co opted the message of Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they have made it into a lie by making it seem that Christ is about the rich and everything is about rich and getting all the money you can, and there's no care for the poor, those who are in prison, those who are sick, those who are less fortunate. And the strangers, the widow, they have become nationalistic, militaristic, um, and they're vicious. This is what we're seeing from the pulpits across the land. So that was the first article that's just sharing another opinion that other people are seeing that we in a shift, and I really believe it. And if things keep going this way, it'll get very terrible for the poor. Um, I'm noticing my time, so the next article, I'm not going to go through the, all of it. I'm just going to introduce the thought because there's some things I want to share with you before we separate this morning. And um, I'm realizing I'm running out of time. I probably spend too much time on that article. But I think it summarizes some of what I'm talking about. So remember, my topic is, and I still have to get back to my topic because I'm kind of just piecing the pieces together with you here this morning, is automation um, and um automation and artificial intelligence and all that and policies are creating a financial shift and we're witnessing we're living in it you know i was remember when i was younger i'd watch documentaries about how things happen back in the 1800 or back in the civil rights time or in various different shifts in in the world and I, and i'm and nowadays i get up every day and i feel like i'm in the documentary and I realized, oh, I'm in the documentary. I'm literally witnessing a shift. And you'll be hearing me talk about this more and more as the weeks and months roll by, by God's grace. Um, we are literally living in a shift where we're seeing things move in some way that is crazy. And it's both moving on a policy and a invention platform. More than that, a few already part. Um, paragraphs here from this article. This is an opinion piece by this lady called Felicia, um, Felicity Lawrence. 
and it's taken again from the guardian and it's along the line of these two things and both these articles i got it from uh sister in the church so it says here how did we let modern slavery become part of our everyday lives question uh, society abhors exploitation but we are complicit the cheap goods services consumers expect makes exploitation inevitable since modern slavery act um, of 2015 british companies um, over a certain size have been required to report on slavery in their supply chain their statements are both shocking and admirable shocking because they make clear that the incidents of slavery have become normalized once again and not just in criminal operations such as the illegal drug trade and trafficking for prostitution but in the mainstream economy the declarations are preface with management expression of abhorrence of course but there they are another note alongside the annual accounts they are admirable however in the transparency must be the first step to tackling this phenomenon last month the national crime agency and just for you know this is coming from britain um, the United Kingdom. So last month, the National Crime Agency reported a 35% annual rise in the number of suspected slavery victims found in the United States, with more than 5,000 people referred to the government mechanism that support them in 2017. Labor exploitation rather than sexual exploitation was the most common of modern slavery cited. Uh, the list um, the list of risk factors for slavery de declares in company statements is long temporary so cold on there and it says temporary workers in distribution office cleaning agents agency labor in logistic operation subcontracted car wash cleaning company um, vehicles construction workers building and renovating company premises outsource security staff a catalog of the casual the casual the, the casualized workforce force in other words it's hardly surprising that most um, egregious forms of exploitation should appear where economic legal and moral responsibility has been deliberately diffused Modern slavery is the flip side of the coin that has seen corporate offshore their profits and dodge taxes, both represented a slot, slowing off of what were seen in the past as important obligations to society. So I'll just pause there. So basically what they have going here is that they'll have a report and a report will list who are getting um, who are, are basically slaves that means they're working and uh, they're not, probably not even getting they're not getting a living wage and so i think that's slavery really um so and these are normal people who are for the most part would be illegal they're working in certain industries the, in the industries that you will call i guess service industries um but the industries that you're at the bottom of the workforce and when you're at the bottom of the workforce you're at the mercies of people that are at the top of the workforce and if you notice car wash um all these different things in logistics operation and if you were in the united states it would be in farming diverse different type of forms so you think about a person working in this situation and their especially their status is illegal they're needed for the job per se because somebody need to do that job but as long as their status stay a certain way they at the mercies of the person that's hired them so to speak and oftentimes they're just working for survival so keep that in mind and this is why i was saying that even as this is happening more and more there's more people being pushed into poor roles and more and more people losing um even these jobs because more and more of these jobs can be automated so keep going here um uh and so here it says then there are the more specific areas of production where big high street retailers statements acknowledge that forced our traffic labor often of refugees as well 
is a well-known and recurrent issue. The British and Irish fishing fleet, the UK meat and poultry processing industry, Leicestershire um, garment manufacturing, the Thai prawn supply chain, the Italian tomato industry, the Spanish horticulture sector, the Assam tea chain, the Turkish garment sector. Separate from corporate reporting, the Gang Masters and Labor Abuse Authority was given power in April 2017 to investigate exploitation beyond its original narrow remit um, of food and agriculture. The more it looks, the more it finds, and some of this new activity accounts for the increased numbers of suspected victims of modern slavery. Another factory in the, the statutory defense introduced in the Modern Slavery Act for those um, forced into criminal activities such as drug dealing, increased use of that defense in drug cases prob probably accounts um, for British victims usually unusually making up the large number of national nationality uh, this year. And so a lot of the people into drugs are coming from Albania, Vietnam, China, Nigeria, Romania, Sudan, uh, Eritrea, uh, Eritrea, um, India, Poland, make up the rest of the 10 um, source country. So notice a lot of finers are doing what you call the dirty work, but who is bringing all these drugs? So much here. The main concentration of um, these gang and labor abusers uh, sees um, are among migrant workers in high, high um, in hand car washes, nail bars, domestic building projects such as basement excavation, the hospitality trade, hotel cleaning, takeaway restaurant, and domestic cleaning. If you're in the hotel industry, most of the people you have ever seen are people that are immigrant, working, cleaning hotels. All these things are immigrant-based. It's just... Um, let me share some points because as I said this article is beautiful. I'm going to give you the title of it again so you can read the whole thing and can kind of get a summary of what's happening um, because when you know basically what they're saying in the article, just for a summary here, is that if you go and you buy a product, and this is where the article had ended. If you buy a product, and the example they give here, you buy a product and say the product, it says, um, a, here they say to the end, it says, a car wash that takes six men 15 minutes and costs 10 pounds does not pay the legal minimum wage. If something seemed to, too cheap, to be true is probably is all right so that's kind of a good summary of what is being said there so i can move on and try to close out with you so here's the thought so you have a car wash as you say felicia says here and uh felicity and and it's 10 pounds so that means a, and there's um six men 10 pounds they wash the car 15 minutes that means they can do 40 pounds worth of work in in um which is about fifteen dollars i think so fifteen dollars in one hour that's sixty dollars and there is six men all right so each man um for that hour we get ten dollars so you know that's not gonna pay the minimum wage because if each of them get ten dollars for that hour's work but the boss has to get some work or cut off of it so what they're making so it's not even getting hit with a minimum wage. So you know that she's basically saying here, if you have something so cheap, then you're thinking, wait a minute, if I go to the store and I buy this product and it's a shirt and it costs $5 and they have to ship it from abroad, bring it here, sell it, the company has to get their cut, the investors have to get their cut, how much did the worker get? So the worker got nothing, but he's working and she's working for hours and hours and hours. He or she didn't get much. Where, 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 what's she working for? What is he working for? And yet what it is is that desperation will cause people to go into those jobs. But the law and the policies that are here and the way businesses run from, you know, quote-unquote capitalist mindset will not cause these people to be taken care of. And so this is where a lot of the problem is coming. And what I say I believe is, is coming on the bottom line here is that 
it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse because the more um, available and the more they experiment with automation and artificial intelligence and you're able to build robots more for cheaper, what that robot is going to do now is make it that you're going to need less people to be able to do a certain job because we're probably, um, I would have to spend a certain amount of money to say buy a car wash and you know with an automated car wash as the technology becomes more um, available um it's going to be cheaper to get into that car wash business and then as one person start buying up car washes and controlling most of the car wash now what you're going to have is that those same six person that goes into a car wash now it's only going to need two because you just need probably one person to kind of do the last last spot, spot cleaning so now you have two people there doing it. Now those two people know that they said enough four people who take their jobs. So now they were already underpaid at five, you know, I'd say they were getting only five dollars or three dollars or three pounds or whatever it is. Now they're gonna be underpaid more because now they're more desperate and they know there are four people lined up to take their jobs. So they'll be like, you know what, been, boss, pay me half the price. So somebody will say, well, that's not slavery because nobody's holding them at that. But it's really slavery because you know at half the price, they can hardly eat. So they're just working to eat. And there's nothing else. And the boss will have all that control. And this is what's happening in so many different sectors, whether it be in the hospitality sector, in the manufacturing sector, because a lot of these jobs are offshore to countries where people are desperate. And so sometimes they're making a decision between just basically working for food, are starving and those who are in this country here and other major developed countries they know that many people in their own country who are signing the deals these free trade deals with the devils they know that but they're in on the scam and they're ripping and pillaging their own people so what i think is the shift coming is simply that the automation as it gets better and more prevalent and it's able to do more is that it will create this problem make it worse because now they're doing automated as i say mining equipment that's not going to change that's just going to get better they're doing automated um um you know you don't need to even do a go to the cashier anymore you just go straight and you can check out if you notice amazon.com is experimenting with, with these automated stores that fill with ai that you go pick up the, the, the groceries and walk out. Whatever you walk out with, you get charged your card. Less people. You don't have to interface with people. As they're making manufacturing for clothes become more automated. And all this type of stuff. What it is, is that whatever happened in the turn of the century with slavery. And you almost didn't need a slavery because you could go get yourself a tractor. What happened with Jim Crow laws. You really didn't need that people say in America giving them civil rights. So you gave them the civil rights, but you ship the jobs abroad. Because I can give you all the civil rights, but you don't have a job anymore because guess what happened? The shipping lines have become better. I can ship it abroad from abroad. I don't need you. Here's the civil rights, but you're you're poor now. You have no you're not even getting a paycheck. And as we see the shift happening now where you could have a self driving car, a self driving truck, all these things. If these technology pan out and go the way they're going, what will happen is that one machine will do the job of 10 men. So those 10 men now, what are they going to do for a living? They're going to become more desperate. But the person at the head of the system, they're going to become now phenomenally rich because they have now more means to extract money and to keep it because they don't have to pay out. And as I say, because I'm out of time, uh, there's much more we're going to talk about this because there's more articles and stuff that I want to share. I want to talk, I said, this I think is the shift. So what the Bible says in the last days that the poor or laborers, it's going to be kept back by fraud. I believe where the fraud is coming is desperation. A man that has not much option become desperate and he'll take whatever you offer to him. But also that man can become so desperate that he'll also become violent. And so the poor are stuck in a situation that it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. But also the rich are being blinded by their own greed because not only are they pushing for automation so they can become phenomenally wealthy, they're pushing the politicians to make sure no laws are put in place that they have to pay but zero, if anything, in tax. 
So the middle class pays the tax, they collect the money, and they enslave the poor. And this it doesn't matter if you're black, white, red, whatever. It's just the system is set and it's being led by the United States. The United States is basically, especially right now with these last few administrations, they're really lock in the credit card system, the loan system, or every system is being set to make sure that as much as the money gets scraped off the top and put in the bank accounts of the rich. So it's not going to get better. I think it's going to get worse, especially as you watch the automation. Soon you will be able to do so much things and never interface with a human being. That means that human being is sitting at home, broke, and is more dependent and more desperate. And we've seen more people are being added to the poor roles. Things have not gotten better. They've gotten worse. So, um, as I said, stay stay um, awake. <laughs> Let's pray. Our oh, Father, what in heaven, we pray that you may bless us and guide us as we look into these things. And um, although I didn't get to some of the solutions I believe in, I uh, pray that um, you may bless in the future and give me opportunity to share some of that, what we ought to be doing. Bless those who are here. And may that spirit go with us, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Thanks for being with me here on Revive Form Radio. Looking forward to talking to you tomorrow morning where we should talk about wisdom for living. We need a lot of that in these days. Until then, I pray that you may continue to walk with the King. Mm -hmm.